This is Tommy Seldor 76. Today we're gonna talk about the elephant situation that is currently unfolding in Botswana, but also in Kruger National Park and other places. Uh, we touched briefly on this problem in episode 66, but today we're gonna dive deep. And there's no better man to talk about these problems than Ron Thompson. Uh, Ron is a CEO of the True Green Alliance, and he started his career as a game ranger in the 50s. And throughout his career, he worked in Africa's biggest and most prestigious game reserves. He is an author of 14 books, and he's one of the most, if not the most, experienced African big game hunter. I want to do that episode for a long time, so I am really honored that Ron decided to give me and you some of his time and uh, talk about these issues. And before I let you enjoy this episode of Tommy Seldor's podcast, I want to say special thanks to Elma Britz, one of the directors of the True Green Alliance, and Professor Adam Hart, who was our guest in episodes 69 and 66, for facilitating that podcast. Without you folks, that episode wouldn't happen. So thank you. And just as a reminder, you can find a video version of this podcast on Tommy Seldor's YouTube channel, uh, unless, of course, you're already watching this on YouTube. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Ron Thompson and the True Green Alliance. Welcome to Tommy Outdoors. It's a really honor to have you and thanks for your time and thanks for doing this. Well, I hope this isn't just the first uh, time we'll be speaking to you because um, we're always looking for a good, a good outlet to tell the British public, particularly the British public, mm -hmm. just exactly what is going on in Africa because the British public are not, they're being shielded from it all by people like Piers Morgan. Yeah. 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 Listen, uh, I think that the listeners and viewers to this podcast can be divided into three categories. The ones who know good and well who you are, the ones who think they know who you are, and those who have no idea but they're interested in the subject. So maybe let's just start with introduction. Okay. You it's wanna, 12 hours. You want to know who I am and what I am? Yes, please. Okay, I'm I, a... I know, but I know that not everybody knows, so it, it, I, I want to hear it straight from you. All right. Um, I've spent all my life in wildlife management. At age 20, in 1959, I joined what was then the Rhodesian Department of National Parks mm -hmm. um, in Southern Rhodesia. Yeah. And uh, I've spent between now and then 60 years, 61 years has passed by. And um, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of that time either working in the field, in 30 odd years working in the field. And um, 30 years down in South Africa, I worked as an author and as an investigative wildlife management journalist. Uh -huh. My interests are wildlife and, and, uh, and, and the management of wildlife. Um, I'm a university trained field ecologist. I used to be a member of the British Institute of Biology for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I was a chartered biologist for the European Union for 20 years. Wow. Um, and I've written something like 15 books altogether. Some of them are textbooks, wildlife management textbooks. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are used in the universities here. So, and I've done a tremendous amount of, of handwork on, on elephants, but my, my interests are particularly elephants and black rhinos. Wow. Um, so, uh, um, but I can hand in, I was, I started off as a young, very young game ranger um, in the department, and I ended up being the provincial game warden in charge of Wanky National Park, mm -hmm. which is one of Africa's premier national parks. Yes. And in between times, I have been required to do a lot of problem and problem animal hunting, mm -hmm. um, vast amounts of it over those over that long period of time. 
I have been accused as being the epitome of the worst kind of of um, trophy huntle that, that there is. <laughs> Actual fact, I have never in my life ever shot an animal, any animal, for its trophy. So this just gives you some idea how false a lot of these critics are. And they don't really worry me, but the wrong message is getting out to the public. My interest is looking after national parks, maintaining national parks and their biological diversity. I don't focus on any one animal. The biological diversity of a national park is the most important function that we have when we are managing national parks. And people don't understand that. Yeah, yeah, and and so so you you mentioned that you're you're being you know often demonized as uh, you know this like you said bad person, and I I am wondering is that something that upsets you and and you resent that or is it something that you embrace and use as a vehicle to spread your message? Because I mean you know <laughs> if you take like a guy it's like oh what this guy gonna ha have to say ah oh, we're not gonna listen. But if it's being portrayed like, oh, this hunter killed 5,000 elephants, right? The people will tune in just for flames. And that gives you sort of the uh, opportunity to spread your message. Yes, it does. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't worry me because my conscience is clear. But people don't look at... Um, at numbers in terms of how many elephants I have shot or buffalo or how many rhinos I've captured. Um, they don't look at it as saying, well, that represents the volume of my experience in the field. Mm -hmm. They just say that this, this labels me as being a bad person. Yeah. And that, that is a bit aggravating because I don't think I'm a bad person. I think that I think I probably know more about the management of all these animals, because I have done that extent of hunting and my hands-on management, than most other people could ever dream about. Yeah. Um, that's how I look at it. I'm, I'm not particularly worried. It, a lot of the time, some of the emails I get, I laugh at them because they are so ridiculous. And it just indicates how ignorant a lot of people are in the public. And when I, when I say ignorant, I don't mean that in a bad way i mean they really don't know what is going on yeah yeah that's 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 that's, that's, for, that's for sure Can i say he's a very kind person <laughs> okay. my credentials are on, on the public d domain now <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and and no doubt you know you and you mentioned that biodiversity and there is a you know worrying thing is that there's a lot of talk about biodiversity but always, all, all, almost or quite often, people who are talking about biodiversity are the same people who, like you mentioned, are misinformed and they have really no idea how to maintain biodiversity and, and how to manage wildlife. Um, I'm just wondering if, if now it's a good time to mention a True Green Alliance because that organization was found to... Uh, spread the correct message and, and inform public, right? Yes, it was. The, uh, the True Green Alliance, its, its vision is to create a society, South African society to begin with, but ultimately global society, that understands the principles and, man and, and practices of wildlife management, mm -hmm. that understands the wisdom of sustainably utilizing our living resources, both domestic and wild, for the benefit of mankind, mm -hmm. that supports animal welfare, that is one doesn't be cruel to animals when you're using them, mm -hmm. and rejects totally the philosophy or the doctrine of animal rights, yeah. because their philosophy is is to abolish all animal uses by man and that is wrong yeah yeah oh yes yes and this is like a important distinction that you made here between animal welfare uh which is which is something i think everybody applauds and, and you yourself and animal rights which is like you said it's a little bit you know not really where we need to go and what we want to do let me let me differentiate the two for you please um, animal welfare people do not 
do not advise the society that man should not use animals for his own benefits. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. If you want to ride a horse or if you want to use a horse to pull a cart or you want to use an ox to plow a field, they say that's all right. There's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. It's good. Um, but in, the, in that use, there should be no cruelty involved in how you use it. You don't have donkeys pulling carts when the harnesses are causing sores on their shoulders and things like this. That is, that is not what they want. They say you can use them animals for that, but there must be no cruelty involved. Yeah. The, the animal righteous say that man has got no right whatsoever to use any animal for his own, for his own benefits. And, 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 and they say that, that animals have got the same right to life that human beings have got. And that human beings should not eat meat. You human beings should live on a solely vegetable diet. <laughs> well, that is simply crazy. I agree. I agree. That's, that's the difference between the two. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I agree. And, and that's, uh, that's thanks for, for uh, you know, saying that and, and, and making that clear for, for our listeners. Listen, um, let's, let's, let's jump in straight into now situation with, uh, with elephants, uh, especially in Botswana, but I know also in, in Kruger National Parks and other national parks. Um, that's something I already explored a little bit with Professor Adam Hart. And uh, again, I would like to hear that straight from you because I, I don't think there is a, any person who has a better credentials to, to actually comment on uh, situation, elephant numbers and recent opening uh, uh, elephants for hunting and everything that goes with that. Um, so maybe I'm, I'm going to stop at that and, and let you elaborate on, on that issue. Okay, let me, let me start off by saying um, this was one of my first eye-opening experiences in terms of what represents wildlife management. Mm. In 1960, I was a very young game ranger based at Main Camp um, in Wanky. And every year in Wanky, we used to count the animals. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, Wanky National Park, which is largely a, a, a desert area, people don't know Wanky. Wanky is, the soils in Wanky, are practically all of them are Kalahari sand based. Mm -hmm. In some distant, far away time, it used to be a proper desert with just sand. Mm -hmm. And there are sand dunes in Wanky. I mean, Wanky is 5,000 square miles of territory, which is quite a big area of land. And there are parallel sand dunes that run from, let me see, from the southeast to the northwest of Wankies, and they're about five miles apart. Um, there are drainage lines, what we call drainage lines in between. There are depressions in between. And some of those sand dunes are 80 miles long. Yeah. <coughs> so you've got, you've got a, a whole series of these of these sand dunes, which are about five miles wide, 80 miles long, and in between there's a, a, an area about half a mile wide, which is a depression running between, between the sand dunes. Yeah. And during the present day and age, during the rains, those depressions fill up with, with there, are, there are pans in them, which are little mud depressions, which gather the rainwater. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in, in those massive and miles and miles and miles of drainage lines, you get hundreds and hundreds of these water pans holding rainwater. Mm -hmm. And during the summer months, they are, those pans are full of aquatic vegetation. They're covered in water lilies. Um, they are filled up with millions upon millions, and I'm not exaggerating, millions upon millions of water and wing birds that come from the Arctic on migration mm -hmm. and it is an absolute aquatic paradise in those in those drainage lines mm -hmm. when you get up onto the onto the top of the sand dunes you actually move into what is now teak forest it's a deciduous woodland um, and it leaves obviously loses its leaves um, every dry season so it gets very dry mm 
The drainage lines which had the pans and all the ducts during the rains become absolutely barren. Mm -hmm. They come dry as well. So unless you put water, put artificial water there, um, there would be no life, there'd be no game in Wanky National Park at all, except up in the north and the basalt areas you get water in the rivers. But three quarters, seven eighths of the park would be totally dry. There'd be nothing living in them except giraffe and ostriches and animals like that that can do without water for long periods of time. Wow. So they put in, when I first went to Wanky in, 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 in 1960, they had already put in artificial game water supplies. These were boreholes that were drilled down into the ground for something, sometimes up to 400 feet underground, and they would pull the water out from underground and put it into these pans that had dried up, that had rainwater in. And that then solved the, the problem of no water because the, the teak forests and the edges of the teak forest, there's a lot of plants there that animals can eat, but they can't eat if they can't drink. Yeah. The, 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 these four, there were 14 boreholes in the park when I first went there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was based upon that we started a tourism industry mm -hmm. where the roads ran up and down the drainage lines between the sand dunes and over the, over the top of the drainage sand dunes into, into different areas. Mm -hmm. And um, that is how uh, tourism developed. Without the water, there would be no tourists. Yeah. And, and the, the elephants, of course, anchored themselves um, in Wanky at the waterholes. Yeah. Now, prior to the waterholes being there, the elephants would come in from Botswana, from the swamps of Botswana, where there's a lot of water. They come in seasonally during the rains and they would live and feed in Wanky during the rains. And as soon as all the pans dried up, they would get out of the park and go into, into Botswana where they used to live. And they weren't all that great in number. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, as soon as we got, as soon as you put the water hole in, those elephants didn't move out of the park. They stayed in the park for 24, um, or, or 12 months of the year. So then you started getting a buildup of the population in the park of elephants. Mm. Elephants are capable, very capable of doubling their numbers every 10 years. Right. Right. This right. is something that people don't understand. You, a lot of people in the public tend to look at any animal and say, well, there, there's a, a thousand animals there. Isn't that great? Thinking that they will stay a thousand animals if, if you know, because that's how they live. That's not how they live. They continue to expand in number. So if, the, if it doubles every 10 years, what you've got to understand is if in year one, you've got a thousand elephants. Yeah. In decade two, you would then have, have twice as many. You'd have 2,000 elephants. In decade three, you then have 4,000 elephants. Yes. In decade four, you have 8,000. In decade five, you have 16,000. So it multiplies like that. And it, very quickly, it, it builds up. I mean, <laughs> it, it seems just like yesterday, I was a young game ranger running around on horseback in Wanky, and that was 60 years ago. Yeah. So um, within 60 years, a thousand elephants can become 60, 70,000 elephants. Sure. Now, then you've got a problem because your, your, your environment can only hold so many animals of a certain species. And if we let's talk, you wanted to talk about elephants, let's talk about elephants. Mm -hmm. Elephants require water and they require food to eat. Okay. Um, when the elephants are low in number, there's adequate water for them and there's enough food for them to eat. Yeah. But as the population builds up in number, so the elephants deplete the, the, um, the plants near the water. Remember, they have to drink every day, particularly in the dry season. They've got to drink, they've got to visit a water hole every day. Now, in 1960, um, these elephants lived around the 14 water holes that we had in the Kalahari sand areas of the game reserve. Yeah. They lived every day. They went, you, the tourists could go there and be guaranteed to see elephants because there was no other water anywhere in the park. Yeah. But now what happens there is the elephants, first of all, they have their drink of water. And why should they walk great distances if there is food available to them right next to the water? Yeah. The, 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 um, the trend was 
that they would start eating the food near the water. And every year, you know, they'd pull them up by the roots and eat them all. Um, every year, they'd have to walk a little bit further away from, from, the, from the water to find enough food to stay alive. The next year, they had to go further, even without their numbers increasing. When the numbers increase at the same time, the, the demand on the food that the elephants eat gets bigger and bigger every decade. Mm -hmm. So the elephants have to move further and further apart. Is that, is that a natural process or is it a sim symptom of uh, that the carrying capacity of the land wasn't just there to support these elephants around the water holes? When there's no water hole, there is no carrying capacity for elephants. Zero. That's why the elephants move out of the area. They go somewhere else where they can get food and they can get water. Gotcha. As soon as you supply water like you have in Wanky, you supply water or there is water there, then their carrying capacity is dependent upon the amount of food that is available to them within walking distance of that water. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in Wanky, it was different in various other places. There was no water. Except up in the high up in the basalt areas, there was some water. Elephant populations were low. There was none in the seven eighths of the park in the lower area. Mm. But now what happens is that these elephants grow in number and they eat all the food near the water and they eventually shift themselves out. They, they spread out. They have, they have to come to water every day at the height of the dry season. They've got to eat every day. And as the, as the food gets depleted, so the elephants move further and further away from the water. Yeah. Today in Botswana, those elephants are moving up to 25 kilometers or 10 miles. Whether you, are you a kilometer man or a mile man? Uh, I'm, what do you I'm, use in England? Miles. I'm deep inside kilometer man because I was born in Poland, but I'm for so many years here that the miles work too. And I always have in mind our listeners who are probably mostly mile operating in miles. Okay, well, let's, let's talk in miles. Nowadays in Botswana, those elephants will walk up to 10 miles away from the water that they drink every day hmm. because in the 10 miles, there is no food available for them to eat. They've eaten it all out. Mm -hmm. They've ring barked all the trees. The trees have all died. Mm -hmm. What worries me is that they've been wiping out the baobab trees. And some of the baobab trees in these game reserves are 5,000 years old. Yeah. That means, to give you some idea of their age, those big trees were 1,700 years old when Tutankhamun was still pharaoh of Egypt. Exactly, man. Yeah. A group of bull elephants will stand next to those trees and wipe out one of these giant baobabs out in one afternoon's feed. Not quite. In a one month's feed, they will, they will kill the baobabs. Mm -hmm. And they're killing all the baobabs, not just one or two, everything. Yeah. So we, we've got these problems, but, but now what you've got to understand is that if your elephants are going 10 miles every day to, um, to get food to eat and walking back every day the 10 miles to get to water to drink, which they've got to drink, they've got to eat, they've got to, they've got to commute that distance every day, mm -hmm. which is 20, 20 miles. They yeah. walk 20 miles every day to stay alive. <laughs> now, that includes... The Tiny baby elephants have got to walk that distance too. Mm -hmm. And what happens eventually, as your population numbers increase, the elephants can't walk any more than 10 miles a day because they don't have the energy to do it. The, the energy they get food that they eat mm -hmm. is less than the energy they need to walk from water to where the food is yeah. back to the water every day. So the result is the elephants get less and less nutrition from the food that they're eating. Yeah. And one of the first animals to be affected, your bulls aren't so bad because they have longer legs and they're bigger and they can walk further distances. So your bulls aren't so badly affected. But your breeding herds are, in, are immensely affected by this. Yeah. And what happens is, is that uh, the, the elephants most badly affected to keep themselves alive and more food to produce milk to feed their babies. Yeah. So the first thing that happens under these circumstances is the mothers stop producing milk. 
Mm. And and what happens then is is that the baby then starves. The baby cannot then walk with its mother 10 miles every day to get food and 10 miles back to get its water. So the, the babies get, become skin and bone. Mm. Uh, on this, I'm going to just show you on this one of my books, if I can show you from here, you'll see there, there is a big female elephant. Mm -hmm. And here, down here, this baby elephant. Yeah. Now what has happened here is that this mother elephant in a herd of elephants, this is at a... And she went off with a herd because they have to walk 10 miles to get their food. And the baby... So she came back to the water to pick up her baby. And when she got there, she found the baby was so weak, it didn't have the strength to follow her into the field. Huh. So she then had to leave the baby at the water hole and she had to go off to get her food. Otherwise she would have died. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this is the tragedy of this whole situation. When we get these, these animal rights groups saying you must preserve every elephant, that's the way to look after them. They don't take account of these issues. Yes. And that baby elephant now wanders around until it either dies of heat fatigue or starvation or it, uh, or it is pulled, pulled to pieces by lions and hyenas with then feed on them because there's no mother elephant to protect them. You know, I, I started my service in national parks in Africa when this did, didn't happen. The, the elephants were not overabundant. They did not saturate their habitats to this degree. We never saw baby elephants running around on their own in, in, in the 1960s. <laughs> Never. That, that is, that, that's a new phenomenon. <laughs> Be, phenomenon because, because the, the situation has changed. The elephant numbers have increased. And what happened in Wanky, for example, I can speak to Wanky because I know it well. What happened in Wanky was at the breakup of the Federation, there was a lot of money available in the, in the, in the federal um, um, bank accounts when the Federation broke up. And, Re and Rhodesia was the only country of the three countries of the Federation, that is Re Southern Rhodesia, Zambia, or Northern Rhodesia and Malawi, which is now Zambia and, and, um, and, and Malawi, um, used to be a nice land. Um, Rhodesia was the only one of those three countries that gave up any land to the Federal Department of National Park. So we, they, you had a situation whereby the federal national parks in, were only in Southern Rhodesia. So when the federal government had money in its coffers and the breakup of the federation was happening and there was no feder federal things to put their money into, they put all their money into Wanky. And they added more, more water holes into Wanky because they thought that is what was needed. Mm -hmm. And the water holes increased almost overnight from 14 water holes in 5,000 square miles to 60 water holes in 5,000 square wow. miles. So now you had a multiplication of this problem of elephants eating all the edible food. <laughs> and when the, in, in 1960, this was discussed at length. Um, the big um, Terracopus angolensis trees, which is a, a, a very beautiful timber in Wanky, the elephants were pushing them all down. And it was a, a favorite. And all the acacia trees, they were ring and pushing all down. All the big Mlala palm trees, these tall, thin palm trees, weren't allowed the, the cones that, that, that brought up the, 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 the start of the palm tree. Now we're getting no chance to grow out. As they started to grow up, the elephants were nipping them off and eating them. Yeah. So we were losing the habitat was, was being damaged all the time. Now the, 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 the definition of a carrying capacity is the maximum number of elephants or whatever else you're talking about, talk about elephants, the maximum number of elephants that the game reserve can carry, maximum number, without the elephants damaging the vegetation. Now, in 1960, the elephant count was 3,500 elephants. At a meeting, the whole parks board came down. It was a big event, this game count. Mm -hmm. The whole park board, the chief justice, who was the chairman of the board, 
we had these kind of people, these caliber of people coming down to help count the elephants. It was a big social event for national parks. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they said, well, listen, guys, we haven't solved the problem of these elephants are knocking or destroying the habitat. Yeah. We are here at Wanky. Why don't we have an impromptu board meeting? And let's discuss this problem. Mm -hmm. So they did. And they said they, we counted that year in 1960, 3,500 elephants. Mm -hmm. And already those elephants were destroying the habitat. They were wiping out the mukwa trees. They were wiping out the amlala palms, all the big acacias. They were destroying all these big trees and wiping them out. I mean, miles and miles and miles of trees lying on their backs. <laughs> That's in 1960. Yeah. And they said, we've got to do something about it. What can we do about it? Who can tell me what the carrying capacity for Wanky National Park is? Mm -hmm. And nobody could tell them. Yeah. So the chairman of the board says, okay, but we want to do something. So what's going to happen now is that I'm going to, I'm going to in, take the, my prerogative to say to national parks, we would like you, you we've counted 3,500 elephants in the park in 1960. I would like you to reduce the numbers to 2,500 to see whether that will make a difference. Yeah. It was a, it was a thumb suck decision. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a decision in the right direction. They knew they had to reduce the elephant population somehow. Mm -hmm. And this is where I got involved in, in hunting elephants. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what everybody said, but, but the national park is a sanctuary. We cannot... We cannot destroy the sanctity of the national park. How are you going to do this? Well, every year in the wet season, the elephants would move out into the teak forests in the adjacent, um, adjacent tribal areas, mm -hmm. and uh, they raided crops of the people's crops there. And so we, were, we had to go and shoot crop raiders. So what we did instead, we didn't just shoot crop raiders, we shot every elephant we could find in the areas where the people were living. This had, the, this had the additional benefit that when you shot an elephant, which is very edible, they were right there amongst the villages. So the people had meat to eat. Yeah. So it was, we, we didn't have to shoot an elephant, color an elephant in the game reserve, and, and then not allow all the people to come into the game reserve to take the meat. We could kill the elephant where the people were. And that's what we did. And for three years, that's what, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. But in those three years, the federal government put all this money into the parks and increased the, the water holes from 14 to 60. Uh -huh. And by 1965, despite the elephants that we had shot leaving the park, the number of elephants that came in from Botswana to the water holes, which was a, a godsend for them, um, they had increased the number to, 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 from, from 3,500, less what we shot, plus the extra that came in. And the population in 1965 was 6,000 elephants. Oh. So they all so were we, we ended up with a, a huge problem. And um, so then they started a culling program inside the park because now the, now the, the habitat was being really badly hammered with so many elephants. Yeah. You know what the population of elephants is today in Wanky? It's 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 all, all over ten thousand, is it? <laughs> um, let me say it. If if the if the carrying capacity was two thousand five hundred elephants, and you've got five thousand square miles, that equates to one elephant per two square miles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So just try and remember, one elephant per two square miles is as near as we ever got to the real number we should have had in Wanky. Mm -hmm. Now, the elephant, depending upon where it rains, your elephants are great followers of the rainstorms. Yeah. At the start of the rainy season, they will, they will hear the thunder and lightning and they will go there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can have the very first rainstorm that hits Wanky, your elephants just disappear. Nobody knows where they go. They're just gone. Huh. If you pick up tracks and follow them, what they've done is they've gone to the rainstorm. Mm -hmm. They've gone to where the rain is falling because there you get also little new seedlings and everything come up. And, and then you get all the, what I call the ice creams and lollipops, the things that the elephants love to eat. Yeah. 
all come up with the rains. Mm -hmm. So you can have no rain around main camp in Wankise, but 20 miles away you could have a rainstorm and all your elephants will go that 20, 20 miles to go and, and get all those goodies there. Yeah. Now, so I'm, I say this just to try and explain to you that the elephant population in Wanky goes in and out of the game reserve for various reasons, but it's not static. It's not a static number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, your, your scientist, the way they count elephants today is we used to put platforms up in trees, sit on the platform for 24 hours. We start counting at midday. Mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on, the, on the night of the full moon in October, which is the driest month of the year. Mm -hmm. We get up on these platforms and we sat on these platforms or in a motor car if there were no trees nearby. And you sat there for 24 hours. Had, it, had to have at least two observer, observers. Mm -hmm. And you took turns then right throughout the night for 24 hours, counting every animal that comes down from a jackal up to an elephant. Mm -hmm. That's how we counted in those days. Because they all the elephants visited the water every day. Yeah, that was the yeah. idea. Now what they do is they go up in airplanes and they do transects across the game reserves, and they've got special techniques of counting the elephants. That they fly at exactly five hundred feet above the ground, and they can tell between sections. They put ribbons on the on the structure. And you count between the ribbons, and that tells you it's a little bit complicated, but it works. Mm -hmm. And depending upon a lot of circumstances, some years, if you've had a, 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 no rains in the game reserve, you don't get as many elephants staying back in the game reserve as you would the next year if you had. Mm -hmm. So the elephant population in Anki. Thousand elephants to eighty thousand elephants. Oh God! Let's let's call it, on average, fifty thousand elephants. And what would we say that we had worked out what it should be in nineteen sixty? One elephant per two square miles. Yeah. It's now we have got the number. It's twenty times more elephants than we de we determined in nineteen sixty that we should have in the park. 20 times more elephants. That's, that, sound, that sounds crazy, especially that, you know, you wouldn't like to have like 20 times as much rats as you can have. An elephant is like a, that's a big animal that can do a lot of damage. Yes. Now, let's just, let's just look at this um, in, 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 in other areas like, like, like Botswana, for example. Botswana has got almost the same situation pertaining there. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1960, um, we, the elephants were already demolishing the, the river Rhine forest on the Chobi River in Botswana in 1960. <laughs> That's 60 years ago. And there has been no culling whatsoever in Botswana for 60 years. Yes. So let us say, cutting our thumbs, that, that uh, there's been no culling, but they're doubling their numbers all that time for 10, for 10 years, six times doubling their numbers. Yeah. Can you imagine what the elephant population is like there now? We were um, an old school friend of mine, he ended up being my director, Dr. Graham Child, worked in Botswana in 1960. Mm -hmm. He records all the trees that he saw in the River Rhine forest being wiped out in 1960. He records a forest of camel thorn trees that were 600 years old, and there were 400 trees in this forest. Yeah. He mentions tens of the big uh, knobby thorn trees, the acacia nigrescens. Mm -hmm. They've all gone. Every single one of those 600 trees has gone. All of them, they've all gone. All the big caches along the river has gone. The forest along the river has gone since 1960. Jeez. Now that, that's within one man's lifetime. Yeah. So now I have a situation in Botswana, we have the same as you have in Wanki, where you have probably got about 20 times too many elephants. Yeah. I don't know what the numbers are because Botswana has never culled elephants, has never done the kind of research that we did in Wanki, has never done the kind of research that we had in the Gonorrhoe and in, uh, 
in, in Kruger National Park. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to know what they should be carrying. But what we can say, if you have got one elephant too many, you will end up with a desert at the end. Yeah. If you have got, if you have got 100% too many, that's one times too many, you've got twice as many elephants as you should have, that will be damaging the habitat. Persistently, every year, you will be getting more and more degraded habitat. When you've got 20 times too many elephants, can you imagine what's happening there to the habitat? Yeah. Your biological diversities are going. A lot of animals are disappearing. In 2013, the Botswana government did a count of elephants in, in the area, and uh, in, in the whole of Botswana. And they came up with the number 207,000 elephants. Oh. They also put a, a, um, a, an addition to this. They said at the same time, all other game species in the game reserve have declined by between 60 and 90 percent. Yeah, that's expected, isn't it, right? I mean, it is common sense. But now your animal rights come along and say, you're not allowed to cull elephants. My attitude to this whole thing now is, you know, there are, there are, three, there are three kinds of populations. First of all, now, let me take you one step further back than that. There is no such thing as an endangered species. Mm -hmm. It does not exist. There's no such animal. Mm -hmm. There's a figment of people's imaginations. Do you know why? Because you cannot manage a species. Mm. They say that there are 450, 500,000 elephants roaming Africa today, depending on who you listen to. Mm -hmm. And they live in 150 different populations in, throughout 37 different rain states in Africa. I see where you're going with this. Now, a population, a population of animals is a group of animals of the same species that interact with each other on a daily basis, whose, whose home ranges overlap, and who breed only with individuals in the same population. Yeah. So you find that if you look at the, Wang the South African population, as an example, your Kruger National Park elephants don't mingle with the elephants from Botswana or from Wanki. Yeah. They don't breed amongst themselves, so they're totally distinct. And whatever impact the Kruger elephants have on their habitat affects only Kruger. And, the, and Wanki, only Wanki, if you know what I mean. Yeah. When you say the elephant is an endangered species, what are you referring to? Which population are you referring to? Exact, exactly. Yeah, I see what I see what you mean. That you can you you it depends on the population because you have a populations that are that are decreasing and are uh, I think the term is unsafe. And yes. there are populations that are overabundant, and and you need to manage that. Yes. You get three types. You get the unsafe population, which means it's, it's well below the carrying capacity of the habitat, and it is declining. You get the safe population, which is good in numbers. It hasn't exceeded the carrying capacity, but it's safe. Yeah. And then you've got excessive populations, like you've got all over Southern Africa today, which require massive population reduction. Yes. My recommendation for Botswana, for example, and for Kruger National Park, and for Wanki National Park, and for Gonadaro National Park today, in the first step, mm -hmm. the first step, is to remove the population by 50,000, by 50 percent. Mm. Now, if you've got, I believe that the Botswana mega population as a whole, because it covers a lot of countries, I believe that population probably exceeds 200,000 elephants today. Right. Now, how many elephants do we have to take off that population alone? Yeah. On according to those criteria, it's a hundred thousand elephants. Yeah. People I, I say, how can you do that? How can you do that? I, I don't see this happening, right? Uh, I'm not going to allow you to let it happen, but that's what must happen. That yeah. is scientific. That, that's a scientific conclusion that we have to refer to. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and if we don't do that. We're going to lose all our national parks and we will lose all our elephants. Yeah. It's not, you can't just say, I'm going to stop culling. 
Because those elephants are dependent upon their environment and they, they're destroying their environment. You've got to reduce their numbers to a level where they stop destroying their environment and only let the environment recover. Then you can let your build up cover up to, to the maximum number you've got. It's, a, it's, it's not an easy thing to grasp. And if you are a person living in, 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 in Great Britain and you've uh, never seen an elephant in your life before, how can they contemplate what's going on? Precisely. That's, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm saying. Like, if you're, if, yeah, like, how can you comment on living with elephants if you're not uh, in, a, in a present and real danger of being trampled by that elephant? Right? It's, it's, no. it's this problem that, that it's easy to have strong opinions about issues that you're not affected by and you have very little knowledge about. Oh, we love all the elephants, right? Oh, right? If you're like, if that elephant was a daily danger to your life, you would have a different opinion about the elephant, I suspect. You know, that's, that's how it works. Well, now you know, now you want to know why it doesn't bother me whether Piers Morgan or anybody, any other person like that who with no knowledge about anything, who just wants to promote his own self-image on television, oh. and that's all he wants to do. Oh. How can people like that tell me what to do? And I'm not worried what they have to say about me or about people who think like, we have to do, we do what we believe we have to do. Yeah. And that takes sometimes in the face of, of, of public opinion, it takes a lot of effort to be able to say, I don't care what you say, I want you to understand, but if you will not understand, we are going to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I have a question then um, related to opening the, because obviously based on what you're saying, like a massive reduction of population is required. And so, Opening the elephants for, for, you know, these packages for trophy hunters, that's not going to do the trick because the trophy hunter will come in, they will shoot one or two or ten elephants, right? But we're talking about, you know, like 100,000 or, or, or 50,000 elephants. So, this, you know, it seems like there is a lot of, like, you, like we know, a lot of outrage and a lot of thought of all oh, trophy hunters, but really... Um, the question I have for you, like, what is the point since this is not going to do the trick? Well, my, my advice to Botswana, and I've met the, the, the president of Botswana, and I think he's a very fine man, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he, uh, he listened to what I had to say. He's read my books, and I said to him, you've got two, two levels here. The, the big thing about Botswana is that the opening up of the trophy hunting after it was closed by Ian, Ian Karma, the previous president, which was a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, he says, yes, we will open up the hunting, but the hunting is not going to solve his problem. He's, not lo he's looking at opening up hunting as an issue. But the big issue he should be looking at is, is bringing his, his elephant population down to levels that the habitat can sustainably support. Mm -hmm. And that requires particularly wiping out entire breeding herds. Mm. It's not a nice thing to do. I've done a lot of it. It's not a nice thing to do, but it has to be done. And it's got to be done by people who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, after I had spoken to President Masisi and I had a very good response from him, the animal writers started hammering him. What are you doing? Are you going to be shooting out all these baby elephants and everything? And, and he said, no, we're not touching the cow herds one step back into, into, the, into the dark continent. That's what happened. When he made that statement, he took one step back instead of taking a step forward and saying, yes, we are, because that's the right thing to do. Yeah. And that is the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, any, anyone who's managing even deer herd knows that uh, that's females you need to call to have an impact on their numbers. It's, 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 I pre presume that same works for elephants, right? Yes, there is, there is something in, in saying that um, you should shoot the bull elephants mm -hmm. because bull elephants do more damage to the, to the mature trees than the cow herds. The cow herds hardly touch any trees. Oh, okay. your, your, bulls, your bulls have got a behavior pattern in terms of their rank structure. And if you, if you go to a water hole in any game reserve with your elephants and you watch your baby elephants performing, Mm -hmm. You see two little bull baby elephants banging their heads together, pushing themselves all over the place, chasing each other, 
That's all part, even although they're tiny babies. That's all part of growing up. Yeah. And what those two little bull elephants are saying to each other is, I'm stronger than you are. Look, see how I can push you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, as they grow up and they get bigger and bigger, then those elephants are becoming more and more serious. But at 12 years of old, age, when they are not as, nearly as big as their mothers, but they're still fairly big, they then leave the cow herds and they go and join the bull herd. Bulls and the cows and elephant populations live separate lives. Uh -huh. Your bulls go in bull herds and the cows go in matriarchal herds with, the, with, their, own, uh, with their own daughters and their daughters' progeny. That's what a cow herd is, with a big matriarch, the old, the old lady. Yeah. The bull yeah. herds go on their own, and they could be either one on its own, or one or two, or I've, the biggest herd of bull herds I've seen is 108 wow. in one group. Wow. But they don't, go to the, they don't live with the cow herds. It's as though they, they can't put up. You know, when a little elephant is naughty, the mother goes and beats it with her trunk. And you get all this squealing and trumpeting and shummeling and all this thing, with, as you get with mothers and kids everywhere. Mm -hmm. and the bulls can't tolerate that. They say, we don't want this noise in our lives. So they go and live somewhere else. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, what happens then is that then you get these young elephants having to contend with young adults. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are juveniles now, but with the bulls. They're having to contend with young adults and then ultimately with the older animals. Yeah. And as they're moving up in size, so there's more competition with bigger animals who obviously hold sway. Yeah. Elephants don't yeah. hold down territories like lions do or rhinos or things like Elephants have got no territories, but they have a very strong rank structure. Uh -huh. they, also, they also come into must when, when they're ready to breed. If they get the sniff of a female in oestrus, then that often stimulates them to come into must. And only a bull in must, which elevates its, massively elevates its rank structure, only those bulls are the one entitled to breed with the cows. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, they don't hold down a territory, but they've got this rank structure. Now, how do they get that rank? And they do this by not fighting with each other. You very rarely see elephants fighting, with, real fighting with each other. It happens, but not, you don't see it very often. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that in, in, in the afternoon, your elephants normally go in the middle of the day when it, in, on, a hot, on a hot summer's day, they will go into, into, uh, under the shade of a big tree and they will stand there for three or four hours watching their, their, their ears and cooling off and not moving, just resting and dozing away into their siesta periods. Mm -hmm. When they break from that siesta, and this, this happens, you can hear it every mid-afternoon when you get bull elephants in these little groups. They break from that siesta. The first thing that happens is that these bulls that are moving a bit up in the rank structure, but they haven't got there yet. Mm -hmm. They will go to, to the nearest tree and push it down. Oh. And they're all saying to the next guy, look, see how strong I am. I'm bigger than you are. I'm stronger than you are. I deserve to have a greater rank. Okay. So that's what, it, so that's what, so they're, so this is why they're pushing those trees. It's not like they're trying to eat it or anything. This is, no. this is the way they establishing their, their hair. Right. Yes. They are exactly that. Now, None of those trees are fed on. They're just pushed over. <laughs> so you, you're not looking at just a problem of food for elephants. You've got this behavioral factor which adds to the problem. Yeah. yeah. And this is why I say if, 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 you, want to shoot, if you want to shoot bulls um, with, with hunters coming in and buying licenses to shoot a bull, fine, do it because you're reducing that added effect. On your, on your habitat. And I'm all for, let them shoot the bulls. And everybody says to me, well, all the animal writers turn around and say, but those bulls, those big bulls that you're shooting with those big tusks, those hold the key. They, they, they are the, the gene bank for the whole elephant population. They are the ones with the biggest genes, the biggest tusks, the biggest body. Those are the animals that you want to preserve because you don't want to get rid of all your best genes. Mm -hmm. What they don't understand is that those bulls have stopped breeding a long time ago. They passed on their genes to the previous generation, and those, those are the old guys wandering around on their own, and they are the ones who should be shot. Yeah, yeah. Get I them think, out of I, the way. I think that was the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the original definition of trophy hunting, where you're hunting these trophy animals that are not breeding anymore, 
but they are big, so you remove them, and uh, quite often, and again, I'm, I'm speaking based on my knowledge, so correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, quite often those big elephants or, or big bulls, big males, they're not breeding, but they're kind of preventing younger ones from breeding because they still chase them up, but they're not breeding themselves. The, 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 the very big bulls, if they don't come into must, and they don't come into must, then they uh -huh. don't challenge anybody who wants to breed. You, the, the bull has got to be in must before it will breed. Uh -huh. and, then, and then they are a force to be reckoned with. Two bulls in must, if they have a fight, they have a real fight. But, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, elephants don't do a hell of a lot of fighting amongst themselves. They really are right. passive animals. Right, right, right. That's, that's interesting. Um, so, what, so what is the solution? Like, well, how, how you, because it seems like uh, it's a situation with no, um, well, the, 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 ben, the upside of what you're saying is, uh, is that what I see the, these animal rights groups and the, the current political kind of where, where this is being pushed, the target are trophy hunters. And what, what I'm getting from you, trophy hunting is not the key to solving that problem. So, not at all. so perhaps it's not, it's, you know, to some extent it's like, okay, you animal rights people, keep being busy, uh, you know, fighting trophy hunters while the actual solutions that we need to apply still can be applied. Is, is, is that something that makes sense? No, not me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. No, uh, fine. This is this is where I'm. This is where I'm asking because you know, like, you think it's gonna happen? Do you think uh, any government, like Botswana government, will approve like massive calls of elephants? Do you see this happening? If this, if the the figures I got today were that in the last month, three hundred and fifty elephants have died in Botswana. Yeah. They don't know why they've died in Botswana. They've checked. They haven't been shot. There's no disease factor, um, no, no poaching, um, no poisoning. So what is it? If you, you've got to look at the history to try and get an understanding about what their situation is relative to the amount of food that is available to those elephants and the fact that they're doubling their numbers so regularly. Yeah. The way to solve this problem the true way to solve and the only possible, the only long-term solution to this problem is to say to the people of the West, keep your hands off Africa. Let African wildlife managers determine what is best for Africa. We know what is best for Africa. We don't want CITES telling us we can't sell our ivory or our rhino horn. Mm -hmm. We know what is best for us. We should be left, I mean, do you find anybody for Africa going to America telling them how to manage their white-tailed deer? <laughs> no, you don't. But you get them coming to us. I mean, you, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for example, um, denied Zimbabwe or hunters going to Zimbabwe and shooting elephant trophies in Zimbabwe, refused them the permission to take their trophies back to America. Mm -hmm. And the reason they said was because because Zimbabwe, most of them were shot in and around Wanky National Park, where you've got 20 times too many elephants. They said because the Botswana, the Botswana government could not guarantee the annual quota. The Zimbabwe government could not guarantee the elephant quota that it had on its hunting licenses. Could, could you think of anything quite so stupid as that? But they hold sway. And people like your Prime Minister in Great Britain, who's got a girlfriend who's an animal writer who tells him what to say in Parliament. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind saying these things because that is the perspective that we get in Africa and we don't like it. Yeah, no, 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 no doubt. Listen, I have a, I have a question for you uh, about the, the, the call of the elephant. We, we, I, I think we are, we are almost out of time, but we're going to be wrapping this up shortly. But I have a question that regarding the calling of the elephant. Because like, in my head, it was always, you know, I was, I was watching those videos, those Boddington videos where, you know, you've got to have a, you know, 375 Holland and Holland to kill the elephant and so on. And, and then I heard that something that I 
actually confirmed by reading your website that you're actually you're getting like a R1 rifle, which is what uh, seven by sixty-two by by fifty-one, um, which is which is like essentially three hundred eight caliber. It's like something that I, I use for deer, and you know, it's like oh, like how do you use that a small caliber? for elephant and then like oh but it's all about shot placement but then i think like something like r1 rifle is not particularly accurate firearm so i tell you how i think and you're gonna tell me how 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 wrong i am or maybe i, I got something right that you know it seems to me like the the call that is happening on a herd level you know I see like a bunch of people jumping out of their land cruisers and they're just opening up on the full auto mode to these elephants and you know, it's not pretty. But then I, I read on, on your website and you go like, no, no, it's 60 seconds and it's over. So can, can you tell us how, how, how does that work? This is like a military style operation, right? Well, it's even better than a military style operation. First of all, you've got to know what you're doing. <laughs> no doubt. You've got to know elephants. You've got to know it's it's the the uh, anatomy. You've got to know where the brain is. You know how to get a get a bullet into the brain. That's number one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you've got to have people who are not frightened of elephants. You've got to have people who who are doing the work, who are um, who know how to place a bullet correctly. Who've got the experience. Now, I was put in charge of the or what we call a population reduction exercise in the Ghana Rajor in 1971 and again in 72. Mm -hmm. And we worked for a whole month um, each, each of those two years. Uh, it was very hard work with a very big team of people. Yeah. And we reduced the elephant population in the Ghana Rajor. Now the Ghana Rajor is, is 2,000 square miles in extent. And we had 5,000 elephants in there. Yeah. We've now got 14,000 elephants in there, to give you some idea. And the carrying capacity is probably the same as Wanking Kruger, yeah. which is about one elephant per two square miles, which means in a 2,000 square mile game reserve, you should only have 1,000 elephants. Yeah. That's yeah. the carrying capacity. It's got 14,000 now. In those days, we had 5,000, and I was required to reduce it down. We were still feeling our way then. We were required to reduce it down to 2,500. We got the big team of people involved, biologists, and who would do the physical work of cutting the elephants up and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I selected two other people besides myself to be the shooting team. Mm -hmm. And we went in with R1 rifles. The R1, or the, the 7... It's 13 two, hours. The, the 7.2 um, NATO in Britain is called the SLR, the self-loading rifle. And this is the one that your army was using in those days. Mm -hmm. in, South, in South Africa, they have got... Uh, one, it's the same weapon, but it's, it's all built in plastic, plastic butts and everything, and that is called the R1. Mm -hmm. The R1 rifle, you can shoot on, on fully automatic. Mm -hmm. um, and the SLR, SLR, which is the British version, you can't shoot on fully automatic. You can only shoot one pressure of the, of the trigger, one bullet. Yeah. And that's the weapon that I used. And the reason we did that, we didn't want the public and the press to say, but you're using machine guns on these elephants. This is terrible. See, you have to think about these things. Yeah. So we said, all right, we'll use the British SLR, not the South African R1. I've shot lots of elephants with the R1. But the SLR is virtually the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, even during the war in Rhodesia, I never used my weapons on fully automatic. It's a waste of ammo. <laughs> so um, what we did then, we went in, we, the three of, us, three of us went in simultaneously into a herd of elephants. And, and you generally, they, they walk in sort of late morning, they walk towards a place where they can find some shade and then they, 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 they stay there for the middle of the day. Um, and they start, if once they're walking away, they bunch up. So you get up fairly close to them. We then went in and we had one guy on either side, one guy back. Mm -hmm. And what would happen? Did we shoot the biggest elephant or the big cow? Or no, we didn't. We shot the first elephant that looked at us. Uh -huh. So we, we closed them as close as we can, right up to them. And I'm talking now 
um, almost like being in a toilet and you're shooting at the door and that's how close you get to a lot of oh these my elephants. God. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Um, that's, why, that's why you said that people, that they can't be afraid of, uh, of elephants because if you're afraid, I feel like you're done. You've got to be... You've got to be right up next to them. If you're going to shoot as rapidly as you, as you have to shoot to, to pull, you've got to pull them all down. We were shooting 41.6 elephants per day on average. The biggest number we took out in one day was 57. Mm. And we, when you got into a herd, you took out everything. You took out the big adults down to the tiny brand new born babies. And you didn't hesitate. You couldn't say, shame, I can't shoot this little baby. You just went in and you shot it, finished, and you get it over and done with. Yeah. And that's the, that's, that's the mental state that you have to be in to be able to do this job properly. Yeah. So you go in with, an, with, a, with two good hunters and myself, good hunters, knowing what we're doing, with a magazine with 20 rounds in, with a tracker standing next to you with spare magazines for 20 round, 20 rounds, so you've got a lot of ammo. Mm -hmm. But if you've got three guys hunting, and you have got, each one has got a rifle with 20 rounds in it. Yeah. Uh, have you, you've used these weapons, have you? Like R1? Uh, no, no, I, I, I used, uh, on the shooting range, I was shooting uh, R, uh, AR-15 uh, and, and Kawashnikovs on, on the range, and, uh, but I have a, like a bolt action rifle for deer hunting. Yeah, okay. Well, um, if you've got a self-loading rifle and you're, really up close to an elephant and you're, you're aiming at the brain and you pull the trigger, that bullet hits the brain. You immediately switch on to the next one, you pull the trigger, that hits the brain. The next one, bang, hit the brain. And you're separated apart. You've each got about one third of the herd to, to tackle. Mm -hmm. so let's, say that, let's say there are 60 elephants there. You've got 20 elephants to shoot. Mm -hmm. Every magazine has got 20 rounds in it. You've got three guys firing, firing simultaneously, simultaneously. So they can fire their 20 rounds in 60 seconds, easy. If you can't fire off a of self-loading rifle accurately at point blank range, you, mm -hmm. you've got no right to be holding that rifle. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, each guy has got 60 seconds to expend his 20 rounds. And if you've got less than 50 elephants in the herd, Mm -hmm. You ended up shooting your elephants, they're all dead, and you've still got extra rounds in the magazine. You haven't used any spare magazines. Right, right. So people, people say to me, you're talking rubbish, you can't possibly shoot like that. You can shoot like that. If you take it into account, you've got three people shooting simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And right. they've only got 20 rounds to expend to get rid of those all. And, and that's one bullet per elephant. At that close range, every elephant you hit went down with a brain shot. Right. But I guess the, the, the margin for error is pretty slim. Were there, were there any, any people injured or, or killed during those operations? No. Wow. When we're doing culling operations, which is a different thing, a, a culling is you go into a game reserve, you say we have to take off um, the annual increment. If the annual increment is, is 7%, if you've got a thousand elephants, you take off seven percent of seven thousand. So then you're taking off. You can then afford to go into a small group of fifteen elephants and take them out, and right. then hand them. But when we were doing this massive population reduction, we were taking these, on average, forty-one point six elephants a day, every day, every single day, and processing the whole carcass, skinning them, collecting the meat, doing all the biological work on marking the ivory, taking the bottom jaws and everything. It was a hell of a job. Yeah. Um, when you're doing it at, at that length, you can't afford to mess around with 15 elephants a day. You, you, you know, you'd be, you'd be working at it all year trying to get it done. Yeah. So we just got hit. It was really a, a massive operation. Get all the people you needed in there. Get the job done. Get it finished. Get it over with. And, and we didn't wound a single elephant. Hmm. Every herd that we contacted, we annihilated. None of them got away from us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Everything was, was treated um, biologically. Yeah. Um, oh, it's, it sounds like a very clean job, you know. It, it, yeah. it, it, and, and it's nice to hear that from you that this is to clarify this. Be, before, before, I gonna, before I'm going to go uh, any further, 
uh, you, and this is again something that people don't realize. You, you mentioned that the meat of the elephant is quite edible. Uh, how, how, does it, how does it compare? Is it, is it, is it like beef or is it like, how, how is it, how is it? I'm sure you, you, you ate the, the elephant meat. meat. Yes, we did. It, it's very coarse. It's a very uh -huh. coarse meat. Uh -huh. uh, and there's lots of it. Oh, so how yeah. do you eat? You did one bite by one bite, one bite at a time. Uh, but um, we used to we used to salt it, put it, cut it into strips, salt it, and dry it, and make biltong. You know what biltong is? Uh -huh, yes. Yeah. Well, you salt your beef and you and put it out to dry. Okay. Well, we I, I can show you I can show you piles of biltong, elephant meat biltong, salted salted biltong, that are. That it would fill my sitting room twice over from from one one set of cuttings. Yeah, and and that that was dried and it was sold to to mining people mm -hmm. and to farmers as as protein rations for 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 labor rations and things. In the evening, we would sit with our beers. We did drink beer there too. We'd sit in the evenings around our campfires with our beers, eating elephant biltong. Wow. So it's they say there's no bad built on. Just some is better than others. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And this is mainly the way. So you're, so you're not cutting like steaks or anything like that. It's it's going into built on. No, the only you you can get steaks out of the temple gland, which is very good. Uh huh. Um, there's a lot of talk about eating elephant trunk. I've tried it. Mm -hmm. I nearly wore out my teeth. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I have done is is. Is I've, I've 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 eaten quite a bit of elephant heart. Elephant uh -huh. heart is very nice, and the other thing that is very nice, and I would like to encourage people who are managing elephant herds to 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 reserve this as a speciality, is elephant tail. Oh, wow! Elephant tail makes a makes a beautiful, um, like oxtail stew. stew. Gotcha. And then when you're finished, and everyone's finished biting the pieces, and you throw the bones down, and each each bone is is about this size, you know, around. Um, you take all those, and then you you stew it up again, and you make a beautiful consomme. Yeah. Um, I like elephant tails. It's the best. The elephant hearts and elephant tails. Okay. If you could take those and let the elephant run away, that would be fine. Okay, okay. No, that's good. And you know, that's, that's kind of important because I noticed that uh, a lot of people kind of um, looking at the, at the different, with a different eye when you actually hear that, oh, you can eat, you know, you, you're not, uh, they don't have this mental image, oh, you kill the elephant, take the tusks and leave it to rot. Like, no, you're actually going to use the whole thing, you're going to eat and the people will eat and it's edible meat and you know, you can actually eat an elephant, which I don't think many people realize, especially elephant, in the UK or Ireland. You can eat any meat of an elephant. In Kruger National Park, where they had a big, sophisticated abattoir, they actually cooked elephant meat as a stew and tinned it in great big stews. <laughs> and tourists used to go to Kruger National Park, and then you'd be able to buy as many tins as you want of stewed elephant stew and buffalo stew, which uh. was made in the abattoir. Yeah. Um, so it it is it's, it's very edible. But if you want to eat it as a as a, a steak, um, I would rather have something else. And I'd say the same for buffalo. Buffalo is is very tough. Yeah. Buffalo fillet is very good, uh -huh. and buffalo tail is very good. But then you've only got to take the top half of the tail because the bottom half of the tail is too thin to cook. The top uh -huh. of it is like a tail. Gotcha. Um, and. Uh, uh, liver is very good. Um, oh, liver, liver as well. Okay. Yeah. Elephant liver. I don't think I'd like it. It's a it's a purpley red in color, and it's got venous patterns through it, which don't look very appetizing to me. So mm -hmm. emotionally, I would say I would rather eat something else. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Listen, Ron. Um, to finish that off, people who are listening to this and hopefully they have like a, like a better view now on the situation and, and understand that this can be looked at at the level of individual animal, like, oh, I love this animal, I love this elephant, I don't want anything bad to happen to it, uh, and that we need 
kind of take a responsibility for the habitat and we need to take a responsibility for all the other animals that are sharing the habitat with the elephants who are destroying it. So if people listening to that and after listening to you uh, coming to this conclusion and they say, well, that's crazy what's going on, now I know what they can do, what they can do and, and what they should do and can they support you or can they support these efforts to um, implement sustainable management of elephants in any way, how, how they can get involved. Well, they can certainly, um, I'm the chief executive officer of the TGA, the True Green Alliance, and they could certainly support us in our endeavor to, to get this information over. As you can appreciate, I don't mind what I say to whoever I say, I tell the truth. Yeah. And that is what the British people need, need to have. They don't need more Piers Morgans in this world to, to stop the truth being told. And that worried me very much. That is, I was available there to tell the British people what I've just told you now, and he didn't allow me to do it. Yeah. I would very much like to get on with, on, onto a, a television program like ITV, like, like the one we had with, with, with Morgan yeah. and uh, with Piers Morgan, and to tell the British people exactly what's going on because yeah. they don't know. And it wouldn't be, it, this sort of thing has to go on and on and on because it's, it, it doesn't just stop here. Your elephants, for example, by allowing your elephants to be too many elephants, in Kruger National Park today, 95% of all the top canopy trees have been destroyed by the elephants, more than 95%. That means the habitat for the black rhino has disappeared. And the black rhino requires certain kinds of habitat which are no longer there to survive. The black rhino's density population is dependent upon the amount of cover that they can sleep in during the day. Because yeah. they're nocturnal animals. They, live, they feed at night and they wander around at night. During the day, they go to sleep in thick bush. There's no more thick bush left there. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that when a, when a black rhino goes down to have a drink of water, for example, in the evening or in the early evening, it hides its baby in the bush okay. about a mile away from, from the water. It then goes down to the water on its own and it has a drink. Then it comes back, picks up its baby, and off it goes. And that goes on for the first year of its life. Hmm. And if, because the elephants have cleaned, all, all, cleaned out all the vegetation closest to the water, this is the important thing. There is now no vegetation close to the water. So when that mother rhino puts her baby down and says, you stay here, little boy, I'm going down for a drink of water. I'll come back and pick you up just now. He's lying out there in the open. And for 300 yards away, you can, you've got lions and, and hyenas looking at the, this little, little baby rhino, and they're tiny. They're tiny little animals. Yeah. And, and when they just come and kill them and eat them. Right. So your rhino, will, your black rhino, not your white rhino, your black rhino will become extinct in Kruger National Park and in every other national park, including in Botswana, <laughs> because the habitats are being destroyed by too many elephants, and they will disappear. They will become extinct without a single purchase bullet being fired. Yeah. And all because there are too many elephants. And this, these are one of the intricacies that we have when we talk about elephant management. It's not just elephants we're talking about. Yeah, this is, and, and this is it, that this is kind of responsibility, like, like you mentioned, that's a national park needs to preserve biodiversity. And, and, yeah. we, and we need to take responsibility and be accountable on what is going on there and and that involves sometimes you know not not nice uh decisions and not nice job uh but since we're responsible for that uh, you know animals doesn't have a reign of wild places like they used to have so that's that's the way okay listen um we're gonna we're gonna put the link to true green alliance in the in the show notes of this podcast and and obviously we encourage people to uh, educate themselves, listen to the podcast, and 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 join True Green Alliance. Um, I think that you're doing very important job, uh, and 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 you know keep doing uh, what you're doing because you're obviously incredibly knowledgeable and have a ton of experience, and that that's coming from you. You know, this is this is what we need. Uh, people like you telling how how this looks like. Um, I don't, you know, this is, this is hard because I, 
I think that the majority of people, majority of these animal rights groups, they don't really they don't really want to educate themselves. They just want to be casually outraged at something, and that's like a easy target, and then they move into the next thing. So um, that's, a, that's a hard part, I think. They're not quite as innocent as you think they are then. Okay. Because okay. These, these people are making hundreds of millions of US dollars a year by purposely telling lies to the public. Oh, the ones at the top. Yeah, yes. that's, that's for sure. That's for sure. That was actually, that was actually one of the other things that I, that I was going to ask you. That, um, how, what, do you, what do you think? This is, is this being driven by ignorance? Or is this being driven by, by because obviously people on top, right? They know what they're doing. And they're, they're essentially, as far as I'm concerned, they're mainly what they want to do. They want to harvest donation money. But to harvest donation money, they're misinforming uh, people who are, you know, at their heart, they're well-meaning. They're, they're, they want to do good for the, for the environment and for nature, except they don't know. So they're being misled, right? This is, this is kind of this combination of misleading and ignorance that is driving. Yes, those are, the foot, those are what we call the foot soldiers. Yeah. I agree with you. The foot soldiers are to be pitied because of this. The people at the top who know what they're doing, they are in the biggest confidence industry this world has ever known. <laughs> the animal rights is an industry. It's a confidence industry. Mm. They, their propaganda is based on a lie. For example, they have been telling the world in the, in the, in the line up to the, the, the CITES meeting in Johannesburg in 2016, they told the world for three years that the African elephant was facing extinction. And you can see that it's not facing extinction, far from it. No. If one population is expanding and you have to cull it, then your species is, 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 is safe. Yeah. But, yeah. but they tell that lie. And when you tell them you're telling a lie because of this, that, and the other, they ignore you and they carry on telling the lie because that lie is the root of the way they make their money. Mm -hmm. So they tell a lie. And if you tell a lie, and, and as a consequence of that lie, you know you're telling a lie. You don't care about it. But as a consequence of that lie, you earn money from the public. Yeah. That is fraud. That is common fraud. Yes. And common yes. fraud, if you, according to the American RICO Act, for example, if you, if you um, carry out a common fraud more than once in 10 years, then if you do it twice in 10 years, that act becomes a racket. And racketeering is classified as, as organized crime. So I've got absolutely no compunction whatsoever in saying that the animal rights movement is organized crime at the international level and that they have taken over CITES, they control CITES. CITES should be, should be dissolved because it is controlled by animal rights NGOs. And it is, a, it is disallowing Africa to get on with the job of managing its wildlife and benefiting its people from the sale of legitimate products like ivory and rhino horn. Ivory and rhino horn should be freely available. Yeah, yeah. Listen, uh, Ron, thanks very much for your time. I, I appreciate that greatly. Um, I, I always ask at the end of the qu that question, is there anything else that would, that you would like to that would, you would like to cover that we didn't cover so far, or or are we pretty much good to go? You haven't got time for me to tell you what has to be covered. It can go on and on and on forever, and maybe we can do this again sometime. I, but I I'm, think that absolutely. you've covered a great deal, and I'm very thankful for. Uh, okay. I, I thank you for thank you and thanks Elma for for. Uh, facilitating that uh it's it's been great talking to you and i'm absolutely you know uh, uh I'm, I'm i'm i would i would love to do that again uh sometime soon so let's stay in touch and let's do that again right and try and tell your people if they really want to get something done we are at this all the time we are informing people of the truth ask them to join the tga as members and then they will get get all this truth we've got i've got blogs and blogs and blogs about elephant management on our on our true green alliance website and if they get onto our website they can read all about it it's all in there
Absolutely. The link to that website will be on the show notes uh, of that show. Um, and uh, Ron and Emma, again, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.